activities and as part of the special week of Centennial uh, Opportunities. My name is Stephen Rothstein and I'm the Executive Director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation and on behalf of all my colleagues at the Foundation and Jamie Roth and all the colleagues at the Library, we're thrilled that all of you are here that you're in for a special, special treat tonight. Before I talk about the book, just a few other quick things first. First, to thank our sponsors for tonight and for the forum series, the Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and BUR. In addition to tonight, on your chair is a brochure of different activities. Um, as you know, a week from today is the actual centennial birthday uh, for John F. Kennedy, we have a variety of things. We hope you come back to some or all of these as, as your schedule uh, permits. We also want to welcome those that are watching this streaming or those on um, C-SPAN, and we appreciate their participation as well. Um, after the presentation tonight, our authors have kindly agreed to sign books. Um, and they're, if you don't have them, they're also available in our gift shop for sale, and they'll be signing them out to my left, your right, afterwards. Um, this is a treasure. This book is really a treasure. I know a little bit about this topic, and when I read this, learned so much and how these two skilled writers put together their deep research and told a uh, fascinating story of, of the road to Camelot inside JFK's five-year campaign. Before I introduce the two authors, I want to welcome back um, Ellen Fitzpatrick. Many of you have, have heard Ellen before. She's been here many times, both as a moderator and author and as a scholar in so many ways. For each of these three, again, I could tell so much about their background. I'm just going to give a few sentences on each one so we can get to the meat of this. But Ellen is a, a professor of history at the University of New Hampshire. She's written eight books including many bestsellers, Letter to Jackie, Condolences from a Grieving Nation, and The Highest Glass Ceiling, Women's Quest for American Presidency, and so much more. Uh, Thomas is a Pulitzer Prize journalist. He was a political reporter for The Globe for 40 years. He started when he was four years old, he told me. And the author of four books, he was named one of Washington's 50 most influential journalists by Washington Magazine. And Curtis is, was a national and foreign correspondent for the Globe. He now teaches journalism at the University of Mississippi. He covered eight presidential campaigns, seven for the Globe, and served as a White House correspondent. They have so much knowledge among and between them. Please join me to welcome the three of them. Thank you so much. I feel like a school marm with my two pupils over here. It's a good thing classes are over. They were actually nervous uh, in advance about, uh, you know, the, the academic historian going for blood here. But really, this is a, such a wonderful book that fills in a story that many of us, I suspect, think we already know. How many of you remember the 1960 campaign? Quite a few hands going <laughs> up. Well, I can tell you that you don't know anything about it. Uh, and you'll learn so much from reading this book, as I did. It's an absolutely fascinating study. Um, I have had the advantage of reading the book, and most of you, I assume, have not. So I thought I would, instead of grilling these two, uh, really ask some uh, open-ended questions to get allow you to get a sense of what, what the story is that they have to tell about this remarkable campaign. And in some sense, I think the, uh, the, narr the, the punchline is given away in the subtitle, which is that this was a five-year undertaking on the part of the very young John F. Kennedy. So um, when we think about the 1960 campaign, I think very few people appreciate that uh, it began as early as it did, that Kennedy set his sights on the presidency as early as he did, uh, and that it was as methodical as it was, and very instrumental not only in getting him to the White House, but it affected his time in the Senate, and it affected the whole political world that we inhabit today. This was one of those 
uh, really transformative moments in American political history. So that's my plug for you guys. Not bad, huh? Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> you know so, what's coming now. <laughs> no, I want you to begin by telling me something that, telling all of, uh, all of our, our wonderful uh, attendees tonight uh, what I learned when I got to the acknowledgments, which is how this came about, this, your collaboration, and how you decided to do the book. Well, I guess I can start with my beginning. I, I was fascinated by the 1956 Democratic Convention, which I watched as a teenager on a very snowy black and white television set in Mississippi. And uh, there was such drama in that fight for the vice presidential nomination. Adlai Stevenson, another example of his indecisiveness, uh, instead of picking his own running mate, threw it to the convention. And so there was an enormous fight that went on between some very prominent Democrats, including Hubert Humphrey, um, Mayor Bob Wagner from New York, uh, old Senator Albert Gore from Tennessee, and then Estes Kefauver, who uh, ultimately won the nomination, and this young, uh, unheard of senator from Massachusetts, John Kennedy. And Kennedy damn near won the thing. Uh, it was a, kind of a Pier 6 brawl. It was the last time that um, uh, a convention uh, had multiple ballots. It's hard to believe particularly when John Davis took a hundred and something uh, uh, full ballots. Um, so I was fascinated. I wanted to write a book about it. And I did some work. I actually came to the Kennedy Library in, uh, let's say, 2002 and did some research, uh, interviewed some people who are no longer with us, uh, people who, uh, uh, people like Ted Sorensen, uh, uh, Arthur Schlesinger, John Siegenthaler, um, and I had a proposal. No publisher was interested. I finally got an audience through a mutual friend with a very uh, prominent uh, publisher with Simon & Schuster named Alice Mayhew. And I pitched it to her personally in New York and she looked at me and heard me for a few minutes and said, not big enough. <laughs> so I packed up all my notes and uh, went home and uh, Fast forward to about 12 years later, Tom. I was visiting Curtis in Oxford and started talking also about Ted Sorensen, who's a major figure yes. in what we did, Ellen. I think one of the last people in the game who combined intellectual work uh, on the development of ideas, the formulation of policy on the one hand, and their expression in terms of rhetoric uh, on the other. And I've been on this stage, God, more times than I care to recall with Ted over the years. Miss him still. And um, he would argue to the both of us that no one had ever taken the time to understand how this improbable event happened and what the ideas, the thinking was that went into it and how they were adjusted as the event actually unfolded. And out of that came this idea. And commute, computers made it possible for one of us to sit in Mississippi, one of us to sit in Washington, both of us to practically live here uh, and see what the record actually showed. It's interesting because uh, many of you probably read uh, Theodore White's The Making of a President, that, <laughs> at least some book in that series. I think. The 1960 book is the best of those. Um, and yet, the story that he tells, I assign that book now to my students. Now I'm going to assign your book. Uh, I teach a seminar on, on uh, Kennedy's presidency. And uh, in, that, in, that, in the assigning that book, they don't, the students today don't even get it. They don't get how this, all, this whole process worked. The whole political culture of our country, in some ways there's continuity, but there's an enormous amount of change. Tell them about Teddy White and the, what we well, learned from uh, him. Teddy and, White, yeah. you know, that book uh, changed the way political reporting yeah. went. Uh, Tom and I were both influenced by it, all of our generation uh, were influenced by the book. 
uh, but it was a book about essentially 1960. Right. And uh, we became friends with Teddy White, admirers of Teddy White. I think it's a great book. We went out of our way not to try to emulate in any way. Our book starts essentially in 1955 and really picks up in 1956, and we don't even get to 1960 until halfway uh, through the book. So uh, no question uh, White uh, was an influence uh, for all of us, but I'd like to think he was not an influence to us in writing this book. It's a, yeah. it's a very different approach that you've taken, and uh, I think an extremely rich one. Before we get into the granular part of this, uh, I wondered about your views of Kennedy going into the book versus your views once you researched and put this piece into place. For me, my sense of him changed after reading your book, and I wondered if yours did oh. as well. Now that he's 100. If only. <laughs> um, to put that in perspective, a hundred years ago right now, American kids were being shipped to fight and die in France in World War I. So a little water has come under the dam since then. And I didn't have any appreciation for Kennedy as a working politician. One of the dangers of something like the making of a president, it's a different way, it's one way of looking at a presidential campaign, that it's a narrative. He went to Milwaukee and he said, Nixon's a nut job, or he went to, <laughs> yeah, or some other epithet that was current then. <laughs> or, and then he went to New York and there were all these people on Broadway and the voice boomed in the canyons of the big buildings and everybody applauded and went home and then they voted. The narrative. Mm -hmm. We took the approach, heavily influenced in my case by Sorensen, that a presidential campaign is a series of benchmarks, important decisions about how to face the country, and then they play out. And the thing to focus on in that school of thought are these benchmarks. And I think that's what's a little unusual about the approach we took and why we viewed the whole five years together. And what about you, Curtis? Well, I think one thing as a Southerner that uh, I was surprised, I think there's general uh, uh, perception that Kennedy was out front on civil rights. And in fact, he was not. He dodged the issue. He courted uh, some of the worst Southern politicians imaginable. We found in the files uh, here in this building uh, letters back and forth between JFK and uh, George Wallace. and, and and Kennedy is offering Wallace help in his gubernatorial uh, campaigns. Uh, he walked a tightrope between the South, which he needed. He needed their electoral votes. But by doing that, he endangered his standing among African-American voters in the northern industrial states. So it's a very interesting uh, road that he took on, on this issue. But. Uh, he was, he was a real a latecomer on civil rights, and only at the very end did he throw in, and it, we thought was a very dramatic uh, 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 part of the book and the whole story was the call mm -hmm. to Coretta King. Mm -hmm. You know, I, we ran into this ambivalence, I guess you'd say, on several topics, uh, Cuba, uh, many of the domestic issues. You can't speculate about other people's motives. We were brought up in journalism believing that's not something you should do. But with Kennedy, what makes him so challenging is that you see him approach an issue like, say, French colonialism in northern Africa or health care among older people in America. And you're trying to separate out the political from the substantive. And with Kennedy, they are so blended um, that it becomes a, a, a challenge. About all you can do is say how he approached the issue, what he did, how he thought, how people right. advised him. But there's always this mixture in it. Well, from the time, it would seem to me that the Democratic Party, that once upon a time, there was a solid Democratic South. Remember that? <laughs> 
Uh, and from Still that, is. It's Republican <laughs> now, though. From that time uh, forward, uh, most presidents had to deal with this unless, if they were at all attentive to the issue of civil rights. When the issue of civil rights was not on the radar screen for American presidents and in national politics, uh, one could try to finesse this more easily. But uh, really, that became very difficult as the 20th century wore on. So as I was reading that, I was wondering to what extent you felt that that was uh, specific to Kennedy, that what president was going to get elected that didn't try to straddle that, that fence? I, I it doesn't make it admirable yeah, by the, any means. I think the difference is the timing, because the movement really started in 55. Right with the murder of Emmett Till and then Rosa Parks' refusal to go to the back of the bus. And it gained momentum, and in the very period that we're writing about is, is the period where the civil rights movement really emerged right. on, on the scene. Uh, you know, Eisenhower really didn't have to grapple with it. Uh, Truman, other than uh, uh, desegregating the military, uh, it, it wasn't an issue until uh, this time. You know, being, a, being an old hack, journalist myself, I, I rely a little bit on oversimplification. And I think the, the trick with Kennedy and civil rights, the yin would be Martin Luther King Jr., Riverside Church, the fierce urgency of now, okay? It takes a little more effort to have respect for President Kennedy's approach, which I would say is the fierce urgency of how. Right. And it's a different challenge. And watching him change, and he did change, right? Yeah, of yeah. Um, as time wore on in the campaign, there's a moment in the spring of 1959. Politically, he realizes he's not going to get much help in the South. That's going to be all Lyndon Johnson. On the other hand, the movement has been heating up. Things have been happening. There have been outrages. And we found a guy who was working for Walter Ruther at, in the United Auto Workers who was reporting about one particular meeting where all of a sudden one day Kennedy just stood up and said, if I've got the quote right, damn it, the, the Negroes are right. And from that moment, you begin to see a different Kennedy approach to the issue. He was still straddling. He was still very frustrating. But on the other hand, you can see the evolution. And you see it, uh, you, you tell the story of how other Democratic politicians are trying to, and Republicans for that matter too, are trying to navigate these waters after the Brown decision, when it really becomes unavoidable after 1954. Eisenhower wasn't a big fan of the Brown decision. No. And, uh, you know, in, in your narrative, you show that Kennedy and uh, Johnson both struggled with how to respond to this burgeoning civil rights movement that was really pulling them along. And you go back f early enough so that you're showing that Faubus and, and Little Rock and Wallace himself are being changed by both the pressure of the civil rights movement and the massive resistance to desegregation that's occurring. So. Kennedy, in that larger story, comes uh, out, I, I thought, not entirely favorably, but trying to find his way. I, th I think ultimately uh, he came out uh, uh, taking the right path, no question that he did. Uh, and then, uh, as president, it, it got even better. But you show the courtship uh, very clearly of, of these uh, powerful Southern Democrats which would bedevil him through his whole administration. Uh, there's a traditional view of Kennedy's life and politics that imagines that uh, his quest for the presidency was imposed upon him by an overbearing father, and that this, once his older brother died in the Second World War, he was next, it was all a trajectory forward. I think that's pretty much blasted out of the water by your uh, study in which you tell a much more complicated story. But it's a story about an indifferent congressman and a not very effective senator. Um, but somehow that changes, and it changes early. 
when he suddenly, it, or so it appears, decides that the presidency is the thing to go for. Can you talk a little bit about what you think were, were what's the liminal moment there? Well, there isn't an actual moment. Um, the, the, the volume opens with uh, what we call the, the only cardiac doubleheader in the history right. of American <laughs> politics. The Lyndon Johnson followed by the Ike heart attacks. And um, his father comes right into it here because he had the cockamamie notion that Eisenhower might not run again and that what should happen is that despite the heart attack, Lyndon Johnson should run, he'd bankroll it, and his son would be the running mate. Um, well, a preposterous idea, of course. Johnson dismissed it out of hand, but it got, that's the moment when you can see Kennedy reacting to all of this and seeing the possibility in the form of the vice presidential nomination, and it sort of starts there. Um, and from that moment in the fall of 1955, every time he was faced with some issue that uh, basically posed the question of whether you're going to go forward or backward, it was always forward. Um, one of my favorite uh, moments in the fall of 1955, you know, one thing we used to do all the time ahead of a presidential election year is speculate on who the running mate might be. And late in the summer of 1955, there was an item, and remember the old Periscope uh, section mm -hmm. of Newsweek where they had a little hard news and a lot of gossip? And, and there was a, a list, and mentioned on that list as a possible running mate for Adlai Stevenson was uh, John Kennedy's name. And this intrigued the hell out of him, and so he called the editor of the section uh, at Newsweek in New York, a reporter many of us knew named Debs Meyer, and said, who's, who's doing the mentioning? Mm -hmm. And Meyer said, well, me. <laughs> 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 Which is how we used to do it, right? You'd, you'd pull one of these lists out of thin air, and then all of a sudden somebody was being mentioned for vice president. But as we talked when we did the forum on the book Listening In mm -hmm. uh, uh, a couple of years ago, Ellen, um, he had this ambition that had nothing to do with ideology. We're certain of that. He wasn't running, he didn't want to run to double the minimum wage or achieve world peace or whatever. He talked in this off the record conversation, a tape of which was found many years later, about wanting to, it's the Teddy Roosevelt answer, wanting to be in the arena, wanting to be in the center of things, dealing with the huge issues of the day obviously making a difference in a positive direction, but it's being there and being in the most, the highest rung. He said, I think, in the tape recording, it's like the Harvard-Yale game every weekend. <laughs> <laughs> An oddly parochial <laughs> reference for him. But I think it sums up what the nature of his ambition was. In other words, he ran for president because he could. Well, and he was seeking the presidency at a time when it was changing in American political life and becoming a much more important institution uh, than it had been certainly in the 19th century. It becomes, there's a kind of cult of the presidency by the 1950s and 60s in which it's seen as the master institution to American political life. But I wonder to what extent the, uh, the, the 1956 experience of getting, really being seen as a credible uh, candidate to be that close to the presidency made him think, I could actually do this. How important, Curtis, do you think that was? I, I don't think there's any doubt at all, particularly uh, the 56 convention, because even though he lost, he came out of it uh, as this uh, attractive, uh, young guy that people sat up and, and noticed for the first time. And uh, that was clearly the beginning because uh, shortly thereafter, uh, there was a meeting uh, down at uh, the old man's place in Palm Beach and they had, a, a, no, I'm sorry, it was at Cape Cod. It was, uh, it was Thanksgiving. And uh, Papa Joe and Jack got together one-on-one -on -one and uh, 
uh, decided he would run and announced to the family uh, that he was going to run then, formally. But there were a number of things that were already going on. There's one funny incident that uh, for all the years I worked for the Boston Globe, I never heard about this great uh, uh, coup that Kennedy was, it was urged upon him by uh, uh, Kenny O'Donnell and Dave Powers primarily, says, look, Jack, if you really want to be a player, uh, you've got to get control of your own state party, which was right. controlled by John McCormick. So they had a knockdown drag them out uh, near Brawl at the old Hotel Bradford in which uh, uh, Kennedy's people uh, seized control of the party and overthrew uh, McCormick's guy who was uh, 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 an onion farmer from Western Mass named Onions Burke. Uh, it's <laughs> highly comic, and so much of the material we, we found for that was uh, uh, in old Boston Globe accounts of, uh, uh, of this, uh, this battle. And then that then led to the 56 convention. And by the time all of that uh, was in place, uh, and his aides were clearly for it, he had talked to with Ted Sorensen a lot uh, about it in the office uh, early. Uh, I think that I, I can be a formidable candidate. I think that, that I don't want a single person to leave tonight without knowing about Onions Burke. Yeah. <laughs> this is a great story. And uh, this, he was from Western Mass. And uh, I'm not going to tell the story, but. Yeah. I, one of the wonderful things in the book is the way in which all of these figures in Massachusetts politics, who are, for most of us, in the shadows of history, come to the forefront. And uh, Kennedy emerges as like a really hard-nosed scrapper in this he attempt managed, to gain control. Yeah. He managed to show just the right amount of phony reluctance <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> to get Fake dragged sincerity. into this thing. Yeah. As if at the last minute he said, oh, okay, I'll break the guy's legs, sort of, sort of, <laughs> sort of thing. Also, what, what made it such an entertaining story, there are two other aspects of it. First of all, this, the final moments in the fight occurred on a weekend that coincided with the wedding of his sister, Jean, to yes. Steve Smith. And so you have the next president of the United States going back and forth to New York on the shuttle. On the same day, you know, he'd go to St. Patrick's and solemnly help his sister get married. And then he'd get back on the shuttle and go up to Boston to help his henchmen bust Onion Burks's chops. And then it <laughs> went on all day. It was like one of those comedies on old comedies on public. The other thing was that there was a national element. Curtis mentioned that the, what got Kennedy's participation in this was the advice from his pals that you can't go to the national scene without controlling your own state. Um, and that got his attention. And all the way through this fight, he was very careful behind the scenes to keep Adlai Stevenson informed all the way through. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Stevenson was appalled at what he was hearing. <laughs> but on the other hand, he had to sit up and take notice. Yeah. Father Joe was appalled, too. Yeah. Father Joe says, don't get involved with those hacks in Boston. <laughs> You'll soil your hands. It's, it's a dreadful thing. Kennedy ignored his father's advice. They were um, they were counting delegates, lining up delegates at you this know, point in the game. It's even better than that. One one person who, thank God, we had a wonderful couple of days with before Dick Donahue of Lowell passed away, and Dick was a bona fide member of the mafia, very young then. And Dick's job the day of the vote on onions was uh, counting which is a very important job in politics. And in, it, it's the old Hotel Bradford downtown. And the meeting was being conducted at a ballroom that was just covered with mirrors all the way around. Technically, the state committee votes were secret ballot. So Dick told us he positioned himself using the mirrors so that, so that every time a member of that state committee marked a ballot for chairman, Dick was behind him 
recording the allegedly secret vote. And it's a reminder, you know, uh, one thing about that family and those, they were very attentive to detail. The advance work, the preparation, mm -hmm. is, it's a hallmark of one of their operations. And even in 1956, they knew how every member of the state committee voted. Well, this, this point about the Kennedy organization was one that I wanted to raise because, uh, you know, much has been written about it, uh, but, and the, the attempt to bring in the family and also uh, how uh, Bobby Kennedy was uh, so uh, capable and strategic and the uh, creation, at, even at the precinct level, of tracking all of these uh, voters and creating these captains. It's an old style politics. Uh, but it's interesting that the tale that you tell is one in which they needed to create this infrastructure of their own outside the party. And it, in that sense, uh, they anticipate to some degree, I think, the insurgent candidacies of our own time. So I wondered if you could say a bit about that. Sure, it, it goes all the way back to his first congressional campaign race here in 1946, and they formed Kennedy Clubs. I think there were 11 people running for that seat, and uh, they went out and basically did, uh, they started early for one thing, and they formed these clubs independent, Ellen, as you say, of the party uh, structure such as it was, and, and they had loyalists in all the precincts and wards uh, in and around the, the Boston area at 46. He did the same thing when he went statewide uh, in his first Senate race in, in 52. Uh, Kennedy clubs, uh, the leaders were called secretaries rather than uh, executive director or chairman or whatever uh, to make them kind of sound egalitarian, but uh, they were they were totally independent. He did it again when he uh, ran for re-election in 58, and he did it, did the same thing when he went national. Uh, they, uh, they made an end run around the, uh, the party structure and the party bosses. Another way uh, that he differed from the old man, the old man thought that 20 party bosses could deliver the nomination. Right. Jack, all you got to do is you know, cozy up to Tammany Hall and, and, and these, these people. And, that's all you have to do, and they ignored him, uh, and, uh, and 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 created really the first grassroots campaign that was then emulated by Barry Goldwater in '64, Gene McCarthy '68. Uh, uh, Tom and I both covered uh, McGovern '72. Jimmy Carter was successful '76, and it goes all the way to unfortunately Donald Trump. It, it was necessary for Kennedy, particularly so, right, Tom, to go this route yeah. because of the it's so hard liabilities. Because, because he won, Ellen, it's so hard to remember that he wasn't favored to. Right. That to call him an underdog was probably an exaggeration in 1959. The number of people who saw this coming is a, that's a very, very mm -hmm. short list. And the reason was that it broke the rules. Um, it's outside the party. Uh, and just because everybody since then has tried to be outside the party, just remember Kennedy was the first one to actually run that way. He was viewed inside the party at, often as an indifferent Democrat. Um, from time to time, he could be uh, a little bit Republican in his fiscal conservatism. He sided with President Eisenhower on more than a couple agricultural issues that created problems for him in the Midwest all the way through the presidential campaign. Um, he was no peacenik mm -hmm. um, at all. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, right, is a summary of his foreign policy approaches. Uh, we did an entire chapter about it, but uh, the late Joe also made all that work unnecessary with one phrase. He said, Kennedy was Adlai Stevenson with balls. <laughs> Which may be a little crude, but ha does have the advantage of being basically accurate. So he, he was also a Catholic. He was 42 years old. He uh, 
he had, you, by your description, hadn't really done much to distinguish himself as a senator. And so the Democrat, the, this is a moment when the Democratic elite, the primaries are nowhere near as important in 1960 as they have become in our time. And yet he was forced into the primary system to prove himself. The primaries are only part of the story, in, in our view, after what we did, Ellen. I mean, there were 16 of them in mm -hmm. 1960, and Kennedy accepted the challenge not of entering them, but of having to win every single one of them, or their, his case was ruined. But in addition to the primaries, he did something else that no one had ever done before. He had a full-time pollster That's on his right. staff. And uh, young Lou Harris was hired in December of 1957, believe it or not. And through his research in the states, including those that weren't holding primaries, Kennedy got clubs that he could use on Democrats in states that weren't having primaries to attract support. So that while, yes, he swept all the primaries in 1960, he also got states simply because he was able to take Harris's numbers into somebody's office and say, look, you really ought to support me, because if you don't, I'm going to come into your uh, jurisdiction and kick your ass. Right. And, and it worked. <laughs> and it worked again and again. We have, I think our favorite example is the state of Arizona which under normal circumstances you would never have expected Kennedy to win in a nomination fight. Lyndon Johnson thought he had the place aced because he had the senior senator, the most revered person in the entire state at the time, Senator Carl Hayden. We discovered that by 1960, Carl Hayden would have had trouble fixing a parking ticket in Phoenix, and that there were these two brothers in Tucson, Stewart and Mo right. Udall. And he built a campaign around these mavericks. Arizona had the unit rule at conventions, and he got every single one of their votes, and he never should have. Yeah, that was an amazing story. Another example of these people that are brought into the center of American political history who really make these things happen, who rarely figure in accounts of this kind. Let's go to Lyndon Johnson and his choice of Johnson as vice president. This is one of the historians have written about this. There's many versions of this as there are people writing it. Some say that Kennedy had no intention of picking LBJ, uh, that this was a, a sort of a gesture that was made uh, to offer him the vice presidency. And then, much to his regret, Johnson accepted uh, he was certain that he would turn them down, and others say that's not so. I think Bob Caro, in fact, uh, suggests that uh, Kennedy uh, and his brother may have been at odds on this point. Robert Kennedy was no fan, of course, of LBJ's, and, um, but that uh, JFK saw the merit of picking LBJ. So, you guys, I think, come down somewhere in the middle of that, but you do show what a chaotic event it was. Uh, we hope we did, and I wouldn't attest, you know, on my life that our version is 100% <laughs> accurate either because you're dealing with separate narratives from different sides, particularly Carroll and LBJ. Uh, Carroll writes uh, pages and pages about uh, the selection of LBJ, and then on the other side, uh, there are Kennedy people. There's a lot of information, again, this building about it. Uh, we're convinced, one, that Kennedy went to the convention uh, clearly uh, ready to pick Stuart Symington, the senator from Missouri, mm -hmm. and we were able to uh, talk to both of uh, Senator Symington's sons who survived, and they talked about how uh, the, the father was, had been told, essentially. Uh, Kennedy had, uh, both Kennedys had leaked the choice of Symington to reporters that they liked the night before. Then uh, suddenly, uh, and, and, and you're right, I think, Ellen, that uh, uh, Kennedy uh, didn't think LBJ would accept it. Uh, that's one of the reasons, because he was a natural. He delivers Texas, and he helps deliver the South. Uh, but they didn't think 
LBJ would do it, and therefore they didn't want to offer it to him. So uh, Kennedy gets a nomination. He goes back to his hideaway house in L.A. He's having, um, I guess, a late breakfast or whatever with Dave <laughs> Powers, and a message comes in from LBJ saying, from now on, LBJ stands for Let's Back Jack. <laughs> and Jack begins to think, uh, okay, you know, this, this guy has got control of, what, 20-something electoral votes uh, and can uh, you know, certainly help in the South. And he begins to think. He, uh, it, it becomes very chaotic. Uh, he goes back to the hotel and he mentions to Pierre Salinger, uh, how many uh, electoral votes are there if we add... Uh, that we'll have if we add Texas. Salinger says, you're not going to do this. <laughs> uh, 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 Kenny O'Donnell goes crazy. Uh, they wind up in a furious battle in, the, in, in, in a private bathroom arguing. Uh, O'Donnell says, you can't do this. Bobby Kennedy, of course, despised LBJ, and LBJ despised Bobby Kennedy. And so uh, the scene at the hotel becomes... Uh, incredibly dramatic, and, and Tom, you, you finished the tale. The, our contention is that Kennedy bungled this because he should have known that Johnson's attitude toward the vice presidency was not so dogmatic. There were plenty of signs along the way, and we detailed several of them, that um, uh, somebody who was paying better attention to the situation would have realized there was a chance here. Uh, but Kennedy dogmatically refused to. We tell a story of he went, he flew to Los Angeles, the convention commercially, not mm -hmm. on the Caroline. And one of the people who sat with him for part of the uh, trip was to uh, Antonio Brad Tony Bradley, Ben Bradley's then wife. And uh, Kennedy was under orders not to talk at that point because of his uh, voice. Right. And so they were scribbling messages back and forth, and Tony. Uh, what about uh, Johnson for VP? And, and the scribble comes back from Kennedy, he'll never take it. Well, that was wrong, and he should have known right. better. So when he came back up from the private one-on-one -on -one with Johnson that Thursday morning and says, Mike, you're not going to believe this. He not only wants it, he really wants it. And so at that point, our narrative is picked up by Bob Kennedy. Right, that's and I, a wonderful section. Now, of again, I, here, you're, the, you're the genius historian. And we're <laughs> up there, and we're looking at, God, isn't it 16, 1,700 pages, pages of, of, of Bob Kennedy's Kennedy interviews? Yeah. There are three or four of them over the years after the president was murdered. And all of them given only on the condition that the material is not to be used until he, Bob Kennedy, is dead, of course, not realizing what was going to happen. And this is in narrative fashion. And, you know, one of the things that Kennedy knows how to do is give you the old uh, dipsy doodle and forget to put verbs in your sentences <laughs> and get all elliptical. And, and then every once in a while, they'll speak in absolutely crystal clear sentences. And Bob Kennedy was speaking very clearly. And the narrative, he said, was it was the most indecisive period of the entire campaign. We went, we shut the door, we made a promise to each other we would never talk about this to anybody ever, all right? And we kicked Johnson back and forth, and we decided we didn't want him. We decided right. <laughs> we didn't want him. But JFK had a condition. Johnson has to be happy. He has to willingly be part of the national effort in the full, because it's awful if he isn't. And Bob Kennedy's narrative ends saying, we made the decision, we would try to get rid of him, and it just didn't work. That's about as direct a quote as you can have. And there's no evidence to the contrary. Well, he tells that story of going back into to see Johnson and trying to sort of talk him out of it. And he says he has this hangdog look yeah. that no one ever looked as sad as LBJ when he was sad. And his eyes filled up with tears. And 
Bobby Kennedy saying, well, you know, you, this is kind of beneath you. No, I really want to do it. And, you know. Tell her about that, well, the DNC. Yeah, that, yeah. that description's just dripping uh, with contempt from Bobby Kennedy uh, about LBJ. Uh, if I dare use one bit of a uh, four-letter word, but uh, <laughs> during this time that they're trying to convince Johnson to take something else, Bobby Kennedy goes and says, uh, well, uh, Senator Johnson, uh, you can be chairman of the Democratic uh, Committee. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, in the room is Sam Rayburn, Speaker of the House and great friend and confidant of LBJ. Uh, he didn't like Bobby Kennedy either. And he looked at Bobby Kennedy and he said simply, shit. <laughs> <laughs> it got very nasty. That was it. <laughs> the choice, which with hindsight, looks rational, even though it obviously wasn't at the time. You think of the consequences Profound. of those two hours in places called mm -hmm. Vietnam, Dallas, and ultimately in Los Angeles. And they didn't want to do it, but they did it because they felt they had to. And that's a window on Kennedy, too. He felt he had to. And the last question Bob Kennedy dealt with in this 1,600-page uh, thing, could you have won without it? No. Yeah, well, I think that's probably right. So I got a couple more questions before we turn to the audience. And one is your interesting take on the Kennedy-Nixon debate, which are often seen as really, uh, you know, this is the moment the tide turns, everything begins breaking Kennedy's way. And you have a different story about that. You, well, you argue that it was not as decisive a win for Kennedy. Certainly in uh, having people see more of Kennedy as a potential plausible president, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that, I think most of the work on the debates in the last 60 years has been overstated. Uh, we did find some things that had not been looked at uh, before. Uh, the most important uh, after each of the four debates, Lou Harris again, for the first time, no one had ever, I mean, there hadn't been debates before, but after each of the debates, Harris sent scores of people out around the country to build a national sample of about 750 cases after each debate. And he spent the first day collecting the material and then the next night analyzing it. And what he found, no one else looked, was that, yeah, the public thought Kennedy looked great. You know, uh, under the lights in those days, a blue shirt really is better than a white shirt. Uh, it helps if you speak in complete sentences and look at the cameras. <laughs> no question. People reacted to that. And yes, Nixon looked like he'd been sleeping under a highway for a week. <laughs> but the numbers said, so what? Right. Because the trial heats, the horse race, didn't budge a millimeter. And between the first and the second one, and between the first and the fourth, they hardly, the needle hardly moved at all. And we also looked into another, it's an example of something that gets repeated for 60 years, and people think it's repeated because it's true, namely that Nixon was fantastic on the radio, and Kennedy was fantastic on television, and that's really what happened. There is absolutely no evidence to support that contention at all. There was a survey, an audience survey, done by Sindlinger's people, but it wasn't published until after the election. And some indication you have to discount it because the radio listeners tended to be more rural by 1960 and thus more conservative. Um, Nixon was very good in the debates, point-counterpoint. The country was divided, change, continuity, uh, take some risks for peace, Cold War strength. Um, right down the middle, it, we made an analogy in the general election to a couple of guys on a teeter-totter. And in the course of those three or four months, the thing would move an inch or two one way, and that's about it. And the debates need to be re-examined in that context, I think, because they are not the key to the election. Well, it helps to explain how close the election was. You know, if Kennedy won by, what, one-tenth of one percent, 
uh, the popular vote that, uh, you know, had it been this just amazing turnabout, uh, one would assume that it would not have been as close as it had been. Yeah, it was an incredibly close election. It's, uh, I think maybe some of us forget how very close it was. But. The, the impact of television, of advertising, this is the election where we begin to see much of the modern face of presidential politics, it seems. And in fact, the story you tell is a remarkable hybrid of this old-fashioned, democratic, precinct-level organizing and this new moment that Kennedy walks into as our first television president. And his whole political career as will be affected by that, his whole presidency. One thing we bumped into in the research, Ellen, that hadn't been noticed for decades, obviously, was a very perceptive essay about television and politics as of 1960. Uh, the writer thought that it could show you what somebody really was like, even though there was the danger of hucksterism, et cetera. The essay was written by John Kennedy in 1959. I read it. I read it a couple of I mean, months ago. Sorensen placed stuff all yeah. over the place. And this was one of the yes. things they did. And it's astonishingly prescient. <laughs> it is because what he says in this is, is this a force for good or, or not? The, the role that television will undoubtedly play from now on in Americans picking their president. And he says, ultimately, that will depend on the people themselves. And he said there's no question that it gives, it's going to give people a better sense of who the individual is, but whether they then make the right decision, you know, this really is going to be a test of our democracy. And this is uh, JFK saying this uh, before uh, he had ever become president. So it's really kind of a remarkable thing. The other question I wanted to ask before we open it up to the audience is uh, the Democratic Party struggling a, a bit now to, to find its, uh, its way forward in the era of President Trump. And uh, what, are there any lessons to be learned from this? We always say that, you know, we like to tell our students that you're gonna study history, you're gonna take away important lessons from it. Could, if, if uh, those who are making the big decisions in the Democratic Party sit down with your book, is there anything they can take away from this story that's relevant to our current moment? Or is it a tale about the past, dare a bygone we, moment? Dare we be critical of the Democratic Party when uh, Senator Kirk is in the room? Uh, uh, <laughs> It's intimidating to be sitting here in front of Governor <laughs> Weld on the one hand and Senator Kirk on the other. Or the um, Republican Party for that matter, Any of, either it's of the a parties. I think your observation is actually bipartisan. But one thing I took away, and it's, it has to do with how Kennedy operated, and it's not chic, but it's the limits of ideology, Ellen. Kennedy wanted to be like in the room. And between the 40-yard lines, he thought it was possible to move the country forward. So maybe the minimum wage goes to 120 instead of 125 in the first increment. Or you have to tell some Jim Crow politician in the South, all right, I won't send any troops to the South for the first year. But how do you move the needle forward? And when you see a political practitioner as good as Kennedy was, it makes you wonder whether you have to be pure all the time ideologically in order to move the country forward. Interesting. I don't know how you ever factor in, in looking, evaluating all of these different variables that you touch on in your story, how you factor Kennedy himself out because he was such a remarkable political figure and had this capacity to connect uh, in the way that he did. There was something that people really responded to. And I wonder, you know, if you, you take the relative weight, the father's money, the media operation, the polling, the primaries, the, 
handing out money in West Virginia, all of it, without that candidate, would there have been a victory? Yeah, I, I, I was a junior in college in 1960, and it was the first time I ever heard the word charisma, and it was because he had charisma. Richard Nixon didn't have charisma. <laughs> LBJ didn't have charisma. But uh, Jack Kennedy had charisma, and I think that uh, could have possibly tipped the balance in some people's minds, and, and smart as hell, too. Here's one to close on, because it's an ethical question in part. We looked forever, trying to figure out how much it cost to buy a vote in West Virginia. <laughs> we really worked on this, and we, we finally got a little help from, God rest his soul, Dick Donahue, who, who was the point man on organization before the primary. And as near as he could tell from dealing with these county sheriffs, if you wanted a vote in the West Virginia primary, and God, Johnson money, boy, everybody, it, it's a tradition down there. Um, it cost uh, two bucks and a, uh, and a half a pint of uh, branded whiskey. If you used moonshine, it was a full point, full pint. And at the end, if that's what you want out of the West Virginia primary, that's what it took. And Kennedy did it. And Papa Joe sent uh, literally money in suitcases, cash in suitcases into uh, West Virginia. They kept it under uh, hotel beds, dispensing it. Uh, LBJ was sending money uh, to support Hubert Humphrey to try to head off uh, Jack Kennedy. So there's Texas money pouring into West Virginia, too. It was, uh, it was probably the most dramatic of all of the primaries was West Virginia. And one of the paradoxes that is normal in American politics, Kennedy became uh, an early supporter of campaign finance reform. <laughs> it's one of his early legislative uh, maneuvers was to advance this idea. Was that St. Augustine who was on the, on the verge of converting? <laughs> and he kept saying, I'm ready, Lord, I'm ready. Just not yet. <laughs> <laughs> there was... There was a wonderful, uh, Katie Lockheim, who was this Democratic committee uh, woman, had a, uh, a wonderful passage where she was sizing up the candidates uh, in 1960 for the Democratic primary, and she compared them to various barnyard animals. And she said that uh, Lyndon Johnson was a rooster, and Hubert Humphrey was a duckling, <laughs> And I forget, I think she might have said Symington was an owl. And then she said, uh, John F. Kennedy is a cardinal. And that was, a, I thought, a wonderful touch to that Leave flash of red that, that uh, really, you know, catapulted him into the center of American politics and American history. So um, we have some microphones. We'd like to invite uh, all of you uh, to uh, whoever would like to come up and ask a question of our two authors, uh, please come forward. And I would ask that you do ask a question. It's a, you've seen how tempting it is for us to go on and on and on, and we'd love to talk longer with all of you, but uh, to give people a chance to ask questions, if you could keep it brief, that would be great. Um, and uh, we'll uh, take the first. Go ahead. Hi. Oh. Go ahead. Um, I, you mentioned in your talk that Kennedy uh, deviated somewhat from the mainstream of the Democratic Party. And I've also been thinking, ten, right in the 1960s, it was clear that the New Deal coalition was going out the door. So I just wanted to ask, what role did the 1960 campaign, Kennedy and Stevenson in 1956, play in transforming the Democratic Party? And you know, was that, what did that say about the trajectory of the party at the time? Good question. Well, they didn't. There was one breakthrough that's worth thinking about. Actually, it occurred on the Republican side as well. Both parties took a deep breath and embraced the civil rights movement at their conventions. Um, God, it seems like you know that's ancient history. But at that moment when the movement was starting to reach fever pitch, each party endorsed 
to get technical for a second, the section of the 1957 civil rights law that did not get enacted in 1957, which would have uh, authorized the kind of intervention that was authorized in 1964 and 1965. And in addition, each party spoke favorably of the sit-in demonstrations that had begun only that winter in North Carolina. Uh, and it's an interesting moment to reflect that the, you, I've got two institutions here, the National Democratic and the National Republican parties, that looked this monster in the eye in the summer of 1960, and they each uh, stuck their chins out. If only it had had led to more decisive action yeah. sooner, alas. Uh, Governor Weld. Uh-oh. <laughs> and, and keep it short. Keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> While he's going to the mic, didn't you star and write up your alley, the Hensby Pudding Show? That's a true fact. <laughs> so uh, I remember an article in the Saturday Evening Post from the spring of 1960, which I read with not without interest. I was 14 years old. It was called Ten Little Indians. And there were 10 Democrats running for the nomination. And the article concluded that Stuart Symington was going to win the nomination because he had no flies on him. Nothing wrong with Stuart. And Jack Kennedy got to the semifinals or so, but he had two flies on him. One, he was a Catholic, and the other was Papa Joe. And the thesis was that everybody knew that Papa Joe was a crook and had done all the pools and stuff that were outlawed by the Pecora Commission, and that's why FDR sent him to be head of the Security and Exchange Commission, because he knew all the dirty rules. Now, my question is about Joe Kennedy Sr. And you gave a couple of uh, examples in your remarks about occasions, important occasions, where Jack and Bobby simply ignored Papa Joe's advice. Now, I know that Jack wouldn't have won the Wisconsin and West Virginia primaries without, without Joe's money, and those two primaries were decisive in heading off Hubert, or so it seemed mm -hmm. at the time. So that was one outcome determinative thing that Joe did. But what else did he do? Was he just ignored throughout the campaign? Was he a dead letter? His, his, his recommendations were largely ignored, Governor. Um, for example, 1956, the, the Democratic Convention again, which you know, really established his son as a national figure, he called him an idiot. He says, you're going to destroy your career if you try to get in on this doomed ticket with Adlai Stevenson. Uh, West Virginia, they had a soiree down at Palm Beach, and... Uh, uh, the old man got up and ranted and says, don't dare go into West Virginia. There are nothing but Protestants there. They'll destroy you. <laughs> and, uh, and this one is very funny. As soon as he had finished, Jack Kennedy stood up, and there were other advisors. He said, well, we've heard from the ambassador, and this is what we're going to do, which is exactly the opposite of what the ambassador had just been uh, ranting about. So... Uh, I, I, Tom, I can't remember really e I'd any even, time. I'd even uh, urge caution with regard to Wisconsin. Uh, Kennedy's first trip, Governor, into Wisconsin, which cost a few hundred dollars probably, was in the uh, winter of 57, 58. By the time Hubert Humphrey had his very first meeting to discuss a possible presidential candidacy in the late summer of 1959, Kennedy had already made more than three dozen stops in Wisconsin, hadn't spent a nickel on advertising yet. His, his, one of the things that uh, those of us who try to study it keep finding out is that effort on the ground, at least in those days, paid off more quickly and more handsomely than the more lavish things. Now, the, the airplane was a big deal from the father, no question about that. But, uh, but the airplane wasn't really a, a part of life until well into 1959. So um, it, it's easy, I think, a million dollars is what we kept finding was a rough approximation of what was spent to win the nomination, a good bit of it for the airplane. If Kennedy were Symington, it wouldn't have mattered. Thank you, Mans. <laughs> yes. Was Kennedy's courting of the press 
a deliberate thing or was it just a part of his personality? And when did that start? And is that possible today with the tenor of the press and the way these campaigns are run today? Could, could someone personally court uh, reporters uh, up in the Sheridan Hotel in New Hampshire and those kinds of things? Well, K Kennedy uh, at, at one point early uh, considered being a journalist. He was one. And, uh, you know, he wrote. Uh, he certainly had a lot of, of genuine friends in the press corps. Um, and uh, clearly, you know, and we know some of the people who uh, covered that campaign, and they were, uh, they felt like they were uh, his buddies. It, it went more than your traditional arm's length relationship, I think, in many cases. It, uh, and it wasn't so much that Kennedy cultivated, it's just he was, he was an interesting guy. Uh, he was fun to sit around and, and talk to. And uh, Tom and I covered, uh, 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 you know, I covered eight, you covered more than that. And there are not many uh, of these political figures that are a hell of a lot of fun to spend time talking to one-on-one. <laughs> -on -one. Present they, company accepted. Yeah, right. you know, they, don't, they don't read books. Uh, they're self-centered. Uh, I always, <laughs> I would always ask candidates, just for starters, you know, what's the last good book you've read? And, oh, they would dissemble and uh, uh, clearly lie about... Uh, the Bible. Yeah, you know, and uh, 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 see Dick run or something like that. Uh, and, and Kennedy was something of a, of a peer to these people. Uh, it, it, it wasn't uh, exclusive, you know, that uh, that not everybody loved him. He, he had his he had his enemies in the press corps. But as as we found, there were situations where it was clearly unethical. Some of the things the reporters did on his behalf, turning over. Uh, information they knew intelligence that they would pass on to him that would be you know unheard of today you'd be drummed out of the press corps if you did something like that we found uh, uh, several examples of people usually columnists who actually sent him memos with combinations of political intelligence and advice in them which uh, involving a couple of people we really revered as as young people the, uh, the second point, there was a, something that went on in those days and continued a little beyond 1960. And Curtis and I were part of the last generation that really did that. We used to have little groups of political writers. One, my favorite was called Political Writers for a Democratic Society. There were seven or eight of us. And ahead of national campaigns, we would have dinner with somebody who was figuring in the news and either likely to run or already running. Uh, our dinners would be off entirely off the record, no direct quotation of, or attribution of any kind allowed. And the purpose of these meetings was to help us size each other up. We would intentionally ask really rude questions. I remember one uh, colleague of mine no longer with us, sadly. Jack German used to say, the idea is to just stick your thumb in the guy's eye just to sort of see how he reacts. <laughs> not, it's not personal. It was just a curiosity. And we all benefited greatly. We felt we understood more about uh, the, the people we were writing about. And in today's atmosphere, all of that would be impossible. Um, everything is on the record, but nothing is candid. Can I do, uh, just make a personal uh, yes. a Bill Wells story? That, uh, when I was uh, covering the 1990 uh, election here, yeah, and uh, Marty Nolan and I had lunch with Bill at uh, Lockover's, and uh, I, so I had a, you know, a dark secret. I said, uh, uh, Mr. Weld, uh, you know, one thing I need to ask you about early in this campaign, that there have been reports that you were seen running around Cambridge in a red dress. <laughs> and I got this from my friend. They were both members of the Hasty Pudding Club at Harvard. <laughs> and, and Bill Weld immediately confessed that <laughs> I surely was. 
It's really good. <laughs> True. But do you, it's, it is different even from 1990, Governor. But I don't know if he even knows the full story of one of the key events in his election was his endorsement by the Boston Globe. And it was over the dissent of the editor of the editorial page at the time, as you know, the revered and magnificent Martin F. Nolan. And a, a publication was doing a story about this contretemps inside our newspaper that may have contributed to the governor's election. And some, somebody asked Marty, when the decision at the Globe publisher level was made to endorse Bill Wells. And Marty grumbles, oh, about 300 years ago. <laughs> well, that's precisely what Kennedy didn't have going. That's right. Yeah. And that's why all this was that's necessary. Right. Though, you know, one liberal thinker, I think it was Arthur Schlesinger, referred to him as the first Irish Brahmin. Yes, I've, I've heard that say, yeah. but said, but I'm not sympathetic to you it, given to. my last you name. You shouldn't, yeah. Yes, here. Far, far from a red dress question, uh, and it's not just for our authors, but I think for our moderator as well with her academic background. I don't know the thesis and dissertation level research and writing on Kennedy anymore, but I noticed that the oral history interviews that you rely heavily on have been open for a long time, and most of the documents that you use have been open for a long time. So my question really is, why do you think it took so long for this book to be written and to find a publisher for it if someone before you had proposed it? Okay. It, surpri it, surprised it surprised me that it took so long for this ground to be covered. It's well, a wonderful it, question. Yeah. Yeah, t t Tom is more articulate on this than I am. No, I, I should, no. should <laughs> yield, but uh, because he makes the case that there is so much here in this building again that's available that people have just touched the surface. And we were looking at basically a fairly limited period ourselves. Uh, it's there. And there, you know, we're, we're not historians. We're, old reporters who just happen to like to write about a good story and we've always had uh, a kind of a historical perspective in our writing but we're certainly not historians and we're not uh, Tom may be a scholar I'm not um, but um, uh, it's lying there to ready to be studied and uh, you know uh, we would encourage more people to take a a deeper look at uh, what's available, not just uh, the JFK Library, but the other presidential libraries. And maybe, the, maybe the gold mines there. Maybe it's just because I'm personally interested. I did a lot of those oral history interviews that yeah. you relied upon, and I've Is been waiting Larry for Hackman? years for somebody to use some of those obscure yeah. characters. Yeah, I'm, I'm is that Larry? Yes, it is. Hi. Yeah, the audience should know this is one of the first guys, Larry, to do oral history interviews. We consider him worthy of beatification, if not, okay? I think we give him a hand. Uh, let me tell you why. Studying these oral histories here, and in many respects, the Kennedy Library is the pioneer in oral history. Um, and what this great man did at the age, I think, of 22 when he started doing these 23. Years, I wouldn't want to be an actor. You were an old guy then. All right. He would ask really ridiculous questions like, what did you do on that date? What did you do the next date? What did you do a week later? He really didn't seem to be all that interested in whether any of his subjects liked JFK or didn't like JFK. He was extracting information for history. Um, the phrase I've used in answer to your question is that all this stuff is hiding in plain sight. Um, and that until now, too much of the Kennedy field has been dominated for con commercial reasons by people who do gossip and this and that got people even make stuff up. The standards have been very low. You could never pass muster with Ellen uh, writing about, say, Millard Fillmore the way some people write about John Kennedy. 
And we're just hoping in the next 100 years maybe the standards go up some. Uh, because if they do, there's a ton of stuff to learn. What is it, Steve? Uh, there are 25 million pieces of paper in this building. You know, a few of them have tidbits like, you know, there'll be coffee and punch in the conference room at 3 p.m., and that's not really very important. But it's amazing to us how little of this record has been comprehensively studied. I think part of the answer uh, to your really very perceptive question is that the historiography, the Kennedy historiography, suffers somewhat from the same phenomenon that the Lincoln historiography suffered from, which is that uh, somebody does a fair amount of research, they write a book, they have an interpretation, then the next person comes along, maybe not quite as energetic, they use that, that biography or that source as their source, and then they tell the same story, perhaps not in as much detail, they homogenize it a little bit, and then the next person comes along and makes, tells the similar version, but there are three errors in that one, and then on it goes from there. And so what happens is that the same stories are repeated over and over and over again, um, and no one, and people will say, well, what is there new to say about President Kennedy? There have been thousands of books written about him. He was only president for a little more than a thousand days. Uh, what can possibly be new here? The exhibit that's about to open in the library is itself a revelation uh, that will educate and, and show people through objects that there's much still to learn, people who even feel they know his biography very well. But these, uh, these narratives are full of mistakes I think they're full of interpretive errors. I think many of them don't capture uh, really the essence of either the man or the moment. There's some wonderful work that has been done, but when you go back to the well, as these two uh, wonderful journalists did, there's a kind of richness to the sources because of the sorts of work that you did and others uh, that really pays very, very uh, heavy dividends for a scholar or a journalist who's willing to dig in and really look all over again at what we thought we knew. And the beauty of history is that we're constantly rewriting the past because our questions are changing because of the moment that we're living in right now politically. We need to go back again and revisit these questions as you have done in, in your book. So uh, that's a, a great question, and I hope uh, the library does everything it can, I think, to encourage this, and it's just a tremendous resource for that reason. Yes? I haven't read your book, so I'm just curious. In it, do you make any judgment or assessment of regarding the possibility that, you know, the election might have been stolen, you know, regarding the close outcome in, say, Illinois, Texas, Hawaii, South Carolina, Missouri, the, the votes were so close in those states, and there was very strong suggestion that there was some vote tampering. John, help. <laughs> yeah, we, of course we address it, uh, and uh, you know I think the two most famous uh, alleg allegations involve Illinois and Texas, and uh, there is certainly anecdotal evidence that uh, uh, you know there were problems in both states, but uh, in the greater scheme of things, they uh, they were relatively small. They didn't really uh, make a difference. Uh, Illinois, both parties are corrupt as hell there. Uh, Daly was holding back uh, the vote in Cook County to see what the Republicans were doing downstate uh, and, and to determine how many votes he was going to need to uh, overcome the ones that Republicans were uh, manufacturing downstate. Uh, so, Illinois, uh, you know, you, it's, it's basically a wash. Texas, uh, some of the instances they cite, uh, they cite again and again, uh, 
these tiny little counties where, okay, there are 112 people registered to vote and there were 140 votes cast for uh, Jack Kennedy. A you know, big deal in the greater scheme of things. It didn't, didn't change uh, the ultimate outcome of the election in, in either those two states. You know, no question there was corruption. went on was corruption in the uh, West Virginia primary. Both sides bought votes. Uh, uh, there's hanky panky uh, in, in, in state. Still goes on, but uh, I think our bottom line is in the end, it didn't make any difference. Okay, yes. You made reference to his evolution on civil rights. Was there a particular instance, uh, incident that caused that, or was it a political evolution? Could you do that again? You made reference to his uh, changing positions on civil rights, kind of the evolution he went through. Was there a particular incident that caused that, or was it basically a political evolution? Well, I think you're talking about uh, the call to Coretta King in October of 1960. Uh, that's, what, uh, that's what I think we were referring to earlier, that uh, this had gone uh, you know, along, and there was a, a, a Kennedy's position was evolving, and he was becoming more supportive. He had uh, had uh, distinct differences with Roy Wilkins, who was the head of the uh, NAACP. Uh, they battled over the uh, Civil Rights Bill in uh, 1957. They felt mm -hmm. that uh, he had been lacking, and he had become more supportive. But there uh, it's very dramatic uh, development at the very end of the campaign when Martin Luther King had been arrested in Georgia sentenced to four months in hard labor by this uh, basically redneck judge uh, from DeKalb County outside of Atlanta. They spirited him under the cover of night to this dreadful uh, prison in South Georgia. And uh, Dr. King's wife was terribly upset and was afraid her husband would meet a bad end there. She reached out for support uh, to the two campaigns, both Nixon's and Kennedy's. Nixon did nothing. Kennedy did nothing for a while because he had this, you know, the Irish Mafia was also a Praetorian guard in many ways, and they had all made a determination. We don't get involved in this. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to jeopardize our support in the southern states. Uh, so uh, Mrs. King was desperate to uh, find some help. She appealed to Harris Wofford, who was working in the Civil Rights Office, uh, of the uh, Kennedy headquarters. Harris Wofford wanted Jack Kennedy to do something. He wondered, who can I turn to? He turned to Sarge Shriver. Uh, Kennedy was in Chicago at the time, and so Sarge Shriver waited until Kenny O'Donnell and Salinger and Sorensen had left the room, and he went in and said, look, Jack, uh, Coretta King is, is in terrible uh, discomfort. You could help if you just called her. And Kennedy, without ever trying to calculate uh, beyond that, said, sure, I'll call her, give me her number. And he dialed her, uh, her number in the hotel room. And, uh, he, and, and it was a breakthrough. Uh, her, uh, Dr. King's father, Daddy King, was really a more prominent political player than was uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at the time. He immediately uh, was ready to go public with it. He was prepared to vote for Nixon uh, and announced that he was going to vote for Kennedy. Uh, Jack Kennedy went off from Chicago on the plane, mentioned casually to, to Pierre Salinger, oh, I need to tell you I called Coretta King uh, just now, and they said, you did what? And uh, Salinger calls up Bobby Kennedy at the headquarters in Washington. Bobby Kennedy is furious says, well, you know, my God, you know, uh, we've lost the election. He calls in Harris Wofford and the whole civil rights office and yells at him. says, you're not going to do anything further in this campaign. You may have lost it for us with this one call. Jack Kennedy didn't have a problem with it, but they did. But then, curiously, uh, w within a day, John Siegenthaler is very close to uh, Bobby Kennedy, and he's got wonderful oral histories <laughs> that spell all of this out. And he was a friend of both of ours, and we both interviewed John before his death. Uh, he, uh, he got a, 
a call from Bobby Kennedy the next day, and uh, he's, Bobby Kennedy is checking in, and John Siegenthaler says, well, uh, Bobby, I just need to tell you we have a crazy wire report from Georgia that says you talked to the, this crazy judge down there, and don't <coughs> worry, we've already put out a retraction. And Bobby Kennedy says, uh, well, I think you better withdraw that retraction because I did call him. So what had happened, it gets very convoluted, but Governor Vandiver uh, wanted just to get rid of this kind of a Pontius Pilate thing. You know, let's, let's get rid of this guy. He called and said, uh, we'll do anything to get Martin King out of the jail. Bobby Kennedy, if you call the judge, uh, he'll he'll spring him. So Bobby Kennedy actually called the judge. Jack Kennedy called uh, Coretta. Uh, Bobby Kennedy called the judge. Martin Luther King is freed. Uh, it is a, it's a breakthrough moment in the campaign. The African Americans seize on this. There are millions of leaflets printed out by the Kennedy operation that are that flood all the black churches the Sunday before the election. Uh, Nixon did nothing, Kennedy did, and uh, they were all over Harlem. There was a guy who worked for Adam Powell there named uh, Ray the Fox Jones. Uh, certainly, he wasn't at church on Sunday, but uh, <laughs> he called up and said, these things are all over Harlem, and you had this enormous outpouring of African-American votes for Jack Kennedy in these states where blacks were able to vote. Of course, it didn't make any difference in the South because they couldn't vote yet. So well, it was it was, it was, was absolutely, uh, I think, you know, even Dwight Eisenhower said after the fact afterwards. that uh, this, this made the difference in the, in the uh, We the tracked the, the spike in African-American turnout, and if you New York, New Jersey, Michigan, Illinois, Missouri, Minnesota, um, noticeable, 5 to 10 percent above 1956 figures. And yeah, Ike said it swung the election. So did the Republican national chairman that year, a good guy from Kentucky named Thruston Morton. We have time for a one-minute question and a two-minute answer, so Impossible. The <laughs> 1960s is probably the richest legislative history we have in the country in the last half century. And that's due to Kennedy and LBJ. Could you comment a little bit more on what actually happened out of that relationship at that time? It's a very productive uh, period in our history. Well, at the time in 1960, uh, Lyndon Johnson did not have much of a substantive relationship with his running mate. Um, it, that only came later as Johnson's, I think, inherent liberalism uh, had a chance to, to come to the forefront. But at the time, uh, Lyndon Johnson did not even like to use the term civil rights. There was a euphemism preferred by people we called uh, white moderates at the time, constitutional rights. Uh, to say civil rights was almost to argue the question. Uh, Johnson was very much a leader of the Southern Bloc in Congress. Early in 1960, he had helped beat back efforts to change the filibuster rules. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, as we think of him, both the Vietnam Lyndon Johnson and the domestic Lyndon Johnson, is somebody who came along later, not in 1960. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming tonight. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you. Good job.